Welcome to the Classical Happy Hour. I'm your host, Martin Davids. This is the show where my guests and I talk about music while enjoying a tasty beverage. Then we try to play some music together. Today's guest is Craig Trumpeter. What's up, Craig? Hey. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. Yeah, I feel like I haven't seen you much this summer. Yeah, it's been since, like, April, possibly. Yeah. Well, anyway, for my listeners that don't know you, can you... uh, Tell us, like, what you're doing for work these days. Well, I am <clears throat> working with my colleague, Chase Hopkins, running Haymarket Opera Company, which is my main uh, gig, and it's very satisfying. And then I teach at University of Chicago and Northwestern, and I have a few private students here and there. So, I mean, we, we need to talk a little bit about Haymarket, because, we, like, that didn't exist when you moved here. Yeah. So how did, <clears throat> like, were you always into opera? Yeah. I've been a little opera queen since I was 10 years old, I think. Um, standard rep, you know. Uh, I still am. I love it. It's my go-to music. And uh, I just, I love singers, and and I <clears throat> entered, you know, early music also as a youngster, kind of maybe 15, I got excited about early stuff. And so... How'd that, did someone hand you a gamba or something? No, no, uh, I had these wonderful piano teachers uh, and piano in theory um, named George and Susan Fee in my hometown, Midland, Michigan, and they are incredible people, but they also uh, are incredibly educated about music. They're both, she has a PhD in music theory from Eastman and um, George Fee is a, was a student of Menahem Pressler and <clears throat> went to Indiana, uh, got his DMA there. And so I would go to their house for these epic lessons that were like three hours long. And I'd walk out of there with a, you know arms full of records. And one time they gave me this collection of medieval music and it was like Benchois and Dufay, and I went home and just was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't really, I didn't really put it together that I could actually do that stuff um, because I just went to conservatory and, you know, kind of took the regular path that a cellist takes. And uh, then I, what was the question you asked me about how I got into it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just rambling. Yeah, no, um, were you always into opera? Yes, always into opera. Um, I mean, I started off, I just, I love singing. I love the human voice. And so my dad um, is probably the world's biggest Perry Como fan. So we grew up just basically listening to Perry Como all the time and hearing this really beautiful singing. Um and then I discovered Judy Garland when I was like six years old too. Um, so, and while well, her voice wasn't always... Like what, watching The Wizard of Oz? Wizard of you? Oz was my entry. Uh, and then, no, I was like doing those like, you know, albums when she was much older, uh, live performances from London. and Wizard uh, of Oz is incredible though. Like she was what, like 18? I think she was 16. Oh, 16 maybe. and like just so. killing over the rainbow? Yeah. Yeah. No, crazy talent. And I still, I actually listen to her a lot because I just think it's this natural um, singing, but also natural musicianship. And it's just so full of expression, like every word she says. So she inspires me a lot. <clears throat> And none of it sounds artificial. Right. Yeah. It, even though they did have, I mean, in all those movies, you look back at them and they're, they're very stylized in a lot of ways, you know, like the acting and, um, but yeah, it's just this, I, I re read recently that Maria Callas, who's another one of my big, um, inspirations. She said she'd never heard a more beautiful voice than Judy Garland's, which is I feel spot like on. I'd compare her to like really great actors where you don't notice that they're acting, you know, even though there's a lot of art going into right. how they say the words and everything. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of art going to how she sings it, but it's like, you don't, it just seems totally normal. 
I agree. It's like it's it's whatever she's doing, it's right for the moment. And I I hear other great artists where I'm just like a little bit like, oh, they're doing something to that, whereas she was just performing it. Yeah, you don't hear the artifice. Yeah. I did not know you were a Judy Garland fan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who isn't, right? Well, there are people. Yeah, but... I mean, I'm not rocking out to it all the time, no. but I appreciate yeah. how she sounds. Yeah, for sure. It's a great example of beautiful singing. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I went to Cleveland Institute of Music, and I had a fantastic uh, cello professor, Alan Harris, who was ba- the cello teacher of most of the early Baroque cellists of my generation. Actually, we all just sort of somehow came out of his, uh, like everyone I can think of studied with him <clears throat> at one point or another. And, uh, because at my first lesson, he handed me the manuscript, uh, photocopy of the manuscript of the Bach suites on a Magdalena. He said, you work from this. So I'm like, cool. Um, <laughs> You and, weren't like, where's all the crescendos and <laughs> fingerings? <laughs> yeah, and he also, he asked me who, what recordings I listened to, and I told him, well, I listened to this guy, you've probably never heard of him. I said, Honor Bill's money. He said, oh no, that's the one you should be listening to. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he saw in me something baroque right away or what, but um, it's, it was just nice, because I know that a lot of cellists run up against their teachers not wanting them to do probably other instruments too, not wanting them to explore Baroque performance practice for some unknown reason. <clears throat> it's true, but I also think some people don't give their teachers a chance, you know? Mm. They just assume that that's what they're going to think and then they, mm-hmm. they kind of hide it. That could be. They're they're embarrassed that they don't want to... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it did have a kind of a stigma when I was... It did, yeah. You know, I don't know if it still does certainly doesn't stink as, as much as it did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember I was, I was back in the closet for that one uh, <laughs> at a certain point, but not with Mr. Harris. He was always very open and encouraging, actually. Yeah, I had a teacher that uh, he's, he didn't know what to do with me, really, so he gave me, hmm. like, Tartini sonatas. Wow. So, and then I was... Uh, that kind of hooked me. Wow. Now that you say that, I, I remember my first cello teacher, uh, Lois Palin, um, giving me sonatas by like Cervetto and Berto and all these like off the beaten path like, Baroque uh, composers. And I, yeah, that was also part of my entry, I guess, into it. Cool. So, I mean, what, how did you end up in Chicago, first of all? Um, <clears throat> that's kind of an interesting story, I guess. Uh, I, was, I had started a DMA program, um, and, but while I was doing my DMA, or starting it, I never finished it, um, I was playing tons of early music. This was in Lexington, Kentucky, and I think I played more early music concerts that year than I did regular instrumental concerts, um, and, but in the middle of the year, I was going to play the Dvorak cello concerto with the orchestra and my, <laughs> my, the neck on my cello got separated from the, from the shoulder. Um, and so I had to bring it to Chicago to get it fixed. So that was the only, that was the only way to get it fixed. And, um, while I was here, I happened to catch a concert that Mary Springfels was giving, um, Mary Springfels, the original director of the Newberry Consort. And I had known her. I met her the year before in Cleveland, uh, and I played in a master class for her. I already played viola da gamba by this time, and um, came up, uh, heard this concert, and she said, "Oh, how are things going? You know, with your DMA?" I said, "You know, fine, but I, I think I'm not going to finish." And she said, "Well, why don't you just move here?" I was like, "Well, why don't I just move here?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so about five months later, I. Uh, came to Chicago and I had a, a wonderful roommate from from a longtime friend now from um, that we met in school and showed up in Chicago and Mary had found me an apartment she was so generous she went around searching on foot looking for places uh, found this really nice place and I showed up and there was a, a gamba waiting for me she loaned me a gamba 
so it was just you know one of the most generous people you can imagine uh and i studied with her for a little while and then she started having me play concerts with her which was really fun and i i I kind of did you know the gig scene and um various things for whatever 15 years maybe when did yeah so moved here when i was 25 and started haymarket when i was 40 so you know how old i am now (laughs) (laughs) um yeah and uh it's Chicago is such a great place. I'm glad I live here. It's beautiful and there's a lot going on musically and artistically and so I'm happy. Yeah. So a lot of I hear people sometimes talk about like gatekeepers and mm-hmm. different things, you know, like opera in particular. And I I feel like you're the opposite of that kind mm-hmm. of a thing, mm-hmm. not in that you don't hold auditions or anything but just the opposite to me of of a gatekeeper is someone that just creates their own gig you know it's mm-hmm. like if someone can't get a get into an opera company mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they can't do anything you know they can just start their own concert yeah so you created this this whole opera company it just didn't exist before right right yeah so in 2010 I was just thinking about what I really wanted to do um, and realizing that I I love working with singers so much. I just love being around them. And uh, I know not every instrumentalist feels that way, but I, I think I find singers to be incredibly fun and um, I just love their energy and I love their repertoire and I love thinking about singing and um, so I was like, how can I, how can I work with more singers? How can I have more singing in my life? And I thought, you know, what is my first love? It's opera. My second love is what I do, <laughs> playing the cello and, and gamba and, and uh, that kind of thing. And so how can I put these together? And I kind of thought, well, why not, why don't I just start an opera company, which was naive you know, <laughs> I had no idea what was involved. Um, but the moment I, and again, I had to kind of come out again. I had to tell people, you know, like, what do you think? Is this completely stupid? And people were not, people were really supportive um, right from the beginning. And then everybody kind of just, somebody, I think everybody was just waiting for someone to do it, really, you know. So um I think my naivete did help in that regard. Uh, cause but people not just many kind of... people want to do it, you know? That's like an insane thing to put, to make happen. Yeah. And, and I mean, truthfully, I didn't, I didn't really know what was involved or I might have thought twice about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it is, it is, you know, it's a lot of work. And uh, I've always had, Jerry Luzike has always been there helping me, you know, constantly with everything. Um, and tons of people, you all, the whole community has come to help. Um, so it's, it's still a lot of work, but, um, it's satisfying work. I mean, it's, you know, we get to do these great performances and people love it. And I think, uh, the audience loves it and, um, and it's just fun to do pieces that you don't do all the time you know so like discovering i forget how many we've done over i think we've done like 25 productions something like that and i knew the like three of those pieces before we did them um so it's just learning i've just learned so much i just feel like every day is this you know education because of the things i have to read about and think about and you have to do a lot of writing and um thinking about business stuff which is just you know the most i think one of the most difficult things for a musician to do is at least most of us we don't like when you're in music school you're not learning about business at all you're just learning how to play your instrument and and look and think about music but you don't have they don't really have time i think to give you a practical education on how to make money for instance or you know or save money or you know um, that kind of invest that kind of thing so um and certainly you don't learn about building relationships with 
people like donors and audience members. That's not, you just, you, I think you have to, there's a certain talent involved and you just have to be okay. Like I'm actually a very shy person, but when I'm, I'm called on all the time to not be shy and it's, um, it's really helped me a lot, I think, in talking to people and, you know, building relationships. So, yeah. And if you're the one that built the opera company, you're, you believing in it, you know what I mean? It's not like you're having to fake that you're right. enthusiastic. No, 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 not at all. And I think that's, yeah, I mean, I'm just always speaking from my heart, but it's, it's hard to do that sometimes, you know, just if you're, if you're shy. So, yeah, well, mm-hmm. it takes energy. Yeah. And there's a, a limited amount that you want to use up in a day, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know? Otherwise, you get tired. <laughs> Did you always want to be a musician? You know, I'm not. I, when, of course, when I was a kid, I didn't think about what I wanted to be, um, really. Um, I think I've. when I was much younger, I was really into theater. Like, I, I built a little theater in my basement. And, you know, I collected costumes. I would go to the garage sales at the church and buy all these costumes. And I wrote plays with a friend, and but didn't really perform them. We just, <laughs> we just wrote them. Uh, we did, like, lots of little kind of radio play kind of things together. And um, so I think I had... It's weird, because I, I was always drawn to theater and um, performance, but I was completely paralyzed uh, at singing in front of people. So... I didn't go down the singing route. Um, but when I discovered instruments and that I was good at, you know, I started off as a pianist and then started playing cello right away. Um, and it came pretty quickly to me. So it was, and I loved it. So I just, I practiced a lot. No one ever told me to practice. Like, I think I'm one of those freaky kids who my parents never once said, did you practice today? Um, cause I just, of course I did. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think at a certain point, my my teachers, uh, the fees, um, kind of tested me at one point. They said, you know, well, well, what are you thinking about doing? This is when I was about 16, maybe. What do you think about doing as a career? And I said, I really want to be a musician. So I did know by then. And they said, well, you know, if there's anything else that you are attracted to, you should do that instead, because this life is very difficult. And I thought about it, I was like, I thought they were, I mean, they did a really good job (laughs) Um, kind of uh, testing me in that way. And then I I just told them later on, I don't remember when, but that I did want to be a musician. And then we started to really work harder and prepare more. Um, And they said basically that, and I believe this, I think that music, they say music chooses you. And I think it did. Because, I mean, it's certainly this work and this lifestyle is like, you have these incredible joys, you know, that you get to experience with your friends and like, you're just communing with this incredible music all the time. So you're just dealing with art like 24 seven and not a lot of people have that, you know? And just when you perform too, like when you make a beautiful sound as a group of people, like there, right. there's like weird chemicals that, totally. that happen. Yeah. And it's just part of the job, you know, but right. that's a great part of the yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. And so we do We do have these incredible highs, and it's so satisfying, but then, of course, there's so much work involved. And so I, it's not for the faint of heart. I think you just, it has to be something that you could not not do, and that's what it is for me. Yeah, I feel the same, like a calling for mm-hmm. me. Yeah. yeah. So I know that's what you feel called to do, but mm-hmm. was there ever anything else that you thought, like, if what, if you weren't a musician, what would you want to do? I mean, even now, um, seen some job that you were like, that looks kind of fun. You know, I'm, I admire anyone who likes their job. And I honestly, like, I think, I think I could like drive a bus or something, you know, like, like work for the CTA or something like that. But I have, I mean, I have an entire other, kind of thing that I do which is the Feldenkrais method um and so I think if like I do think sometimes okay well what if I lost my hearing you know what would I do um and I do have this incredible I'm fascinated by the Feldenkrais method the whole 
way of thinking and um, what it can do for people and like just studying the brain and you know the human body and and functionality and all that stuff is really I mean it saved my career when I was about 30 so uh, it's been a huge part of it's a huge part of every day for me um, so that is something that I think I would just naturally do um, if I for some reason couldn't do music anymore I don't know what why that would well, you know I suppose if I lost my hearing I could still Beethoven was deaf you know you can find ways to you can find things to do I'm not gonna probably not gonna compose anything but so I think though that I could do lots of things like um, I'm interested in a lot of things so I don't know that I have yeah um yeah, like seriously driving a bus or doing something like that where you're kind of helping people. That's something that would interest me. Yeah, Having me a there's got to be a, some interaction with people mm -hmm. to make it interesting. I don't mm -hmm. want to sit in a cubicle. No, I think that would be really hard. And I think that's hard for anyone. Um, yeah, community work. I don't know. I could maybe, my dad was a social worker and a marriage counselor. So I have some of that in my thinking. <laughs> um, so I would be interested in, you know, doing all sorts of things. Um, okay. Um, so what's coming up? Uh, anything cool? What is coming up? Uh, I'm going to go play for the Handel Aria competition in Madison next month, which is a really fun thing. Um, it's a, uh, founded by these two wonderful people who just love handle arias so they were like oh let's have a, let's it was kind of like hey market let's just start a competition so we can hear lots of handle arias and it's 10 years old now and, and it's just it's really fun like the quality of the singing is really great so i'll do that um and then in september we start to prepare finish preparation for francesca caccini's opera La Liberazione di Ruggero dall'Isola dal Cina. Almost got it right. Um, so that's at the end of September at Jarvis Opera Hall at DePaul. So and, it's uh, one of these Orlando Furioso yeah. librettos. Yeah. That's Cina totally and wacky. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's the, uh, the earliest com uh, opera by a woman. Um, Francesca Caccini composed it in 1625 so it's and it's really one of the earliest pieces we've done actually at Haymarket um, yeah 1625 is early yeah I've done it before I did it out in at Utah State with the students out there so I know the piece already and it's it's really fun so I'm looking forward to that and uh, my good friend Jory Vinicor and I are playing all of the Bach Gamba Sonatas at a house concert the end of august and uh then i start is he coming for ravinia or he's something? playing at ravinia yeah uh and then um I my... I'll, I'll try to get him on the show then oh yeah yeah uh and then my university of chicago ensemble is going to focus on music of william bird this year because it's hit the what 400th anniversary of his 400 yeah of his death yeah, I've been hearing a lot about bird. And yeah, bird is the word, and all <laughs> kinds of. <laughs> oh yeah, so yeah, I'm doing a bunch of bird around town, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. He he loved the vial, so. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for, mm. like, young people, if there were like, any young people listening to this <laughs> show, <laughs> musicians or yeah, musicians. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think it's really important to follow your passion. Um, so I never thought I never thought practically when I was I still don't I guess um, younger. I just was like I have to do this thing because I love it and I'll find you know if I make f four cents from it, great. If I don't make anything, um, if I don't lose anything great <laughs> um but so it's just it's just following the thing that you love and i think it's really easy to not trust that and and um do take the safe 
route. And I just, I think it's tragic when people do that, actually, because it kind of, you never really live the thing that you want to live. And um, I mean, I just, I think it's incredibly common and it makes me sad. So that's what I would tell young people is just follow your, your passion and your love and your interest always. And if it changes, it changes. You know, like if you don't, if you become a musician and then at a certain point, maybe you don't want to be one anymore. Don't, it shouldn't be a drag, you know, like <laughs> do something else. Um, but uh, yeah. I mean, I think about dancers, mm. like mm. the professional ones, like it's just a tiny part of your life. You get to do that. That's true. Especially ballet. Yeah. Um, so they've got to do other stuff. Right. And it's, it's, I love dancers too. Cause they, they figure out the most, they work so hard while they're, you know, having their careers that like hard work is, is just at a different level for them, I think. So they can learn brand new things. And, um, I'm in awe of dancers that they kind of, I I think it was Gwen Verdon who said that you, as a dancer, you die twice because you die as a performer when you're quite young and then you have your real death. Um, so, (laughs) um, yeah. So I think, the ones that I know have come up with these incredible, like wacky other careers in really interesting things. So was there a question? That you asked? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, we were just, uh, just advice for young people. Oh, advice. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's Follow your passion. Fine. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So is there anything you want to ask me? Ooh. Um, well, yeah. When did you know that you, wanted to be, to be a musician do you remember I think I really didn't know uh, like I went to college and I just wrote down music as a major because mm. I didn't know what the hell else to write down <laughs> and so I just stayed in that you started playing when you were four four yeah yeah I mean it was just a part of me mm-hmm. like it's basically as far back as I can remember. I don't really so you went, have any pre memories from younger before, than four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um anyway, this has been great. Yeah. Um Should we're gonna take a little it. break and then play something. Thanks for listening. This is actually our last episode of season two, which has been a really fun season, but I'll definitely be back in Ooh. the fall for season three. We need to give him a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah you know it could be anybody on that first episode <laughs> um anyway rate the show uh as many stars as you can on the different platforms and please subscribe to the show and we'll be right back <laughs>